Welcome to all of you, wherever you may be and whatever time zone you find yourself in. Uh, I'm Sarah Doro and I'm the Chair of the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta. And I'm really pleased to welcome you um, to this conference on prison and punishment. If, if this were being held in person, uh, we would be showing off uh, and showing you around uh, our newly renovated space in which the newly minted Center for Criminological Research will be housed. And we would probably be, be uh, handing out uh, department swag um, imprinted with our informal department motto, Inhabit Change. Uh, I think we're doing just that uh, with this amazing online conference and its impressive group of diverse scholars in the field of prisons and punishment. Uh, looking at the lineup, it strikes me that in some ways, uh, we will spend the next couple of days grappling with the question, what does it mean to inhabit change in the penal system and in the study of its histories, practices, and actors? Um, this conference is, of course, the inaugural event of uh, the newly established Center for Criminological Research here in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta. The vision for the center is bold and forward-looking as it focuses theory-driven, empirically rich, and community-partnered research on the most pressing justice issues of our time. I'm really proud of the work criminology colleagues have done to see the CCR, as we call it, um, to fruition. I want to especially congratulate and thank Sandra Vasarius, who was a driving force behind the center and who as its inaugural director has convened um, this, this momentous event. Thank you as well to the host of people who have worked and are working to make the conference a success, including Jeff Broussard. Um, I look forward to catching some of the panels myself, and I wish you all the best and edifying and fruitful couple of days together. Uh, please come and see us in person sometime. Uh, uh, welcome, and with that, I'll hand things over to Sandra. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for all your support to establish the center and get it up and running. Um, we could not have done this without you and your support and leadership. Uh, so thank you. And sincere thanks also go to our Dean Steve Patton, as well as Oliver Rossier from the Faculty of Arts, who have been tremendously helpful uh, throughout the process. And we are extremely grateful that you supported our vision and plans. Now, before I continue, I first want to acknowledge that the University of Alberta, uh, the place from which this conference is hosted, is on Treaty 6 territory a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakoda Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So Sarah has already talked about the importance of the center, but I just want to reiterate how excited we are to have the center up and running, despite the challenges that COVID has thrown our way. Um, we do, the center, uh, we do see the center as a research hub that allows us to continuously grow our reputation as a place that produces theoretically informed empirical research on the criminal justice system, but also as a think tank that allows us to run partnered projects with community and justice stakeholders. And we are really hoping to become known as the place where we can discuss, debate, and share our research findings on sometimes controversial issues with stakeholders in a timely manner, and where our findings will hopefully have some real world impact and can be used to make our justice system, especially in Canada, more fair and just. I want to particularly thank all of our community partners, indigenous partners and justice stakeholders whose strong support for the center helped to persuade the governing bodies of the U of A that the establishment of the center is necessary and will contribute to the criminological research landscape in Western Canada and beyond. So thank you all, this would not have been possible without you and we are looking forward to many years of collaborative partnered endeavors. And to all of the academic audience here, we do hope that you will consider the center as a place to visit in the future, maybe for a research stay or a sabbatical. Now, before we start the conference and celebrate our newfound center, I unfortunately need to share the sad news with you that Roger Hoods, the long-term director of the Oxford Center for Criminology passed away last night. 
Um, as we are embarking on this conference on prisons and punishment, I think many of you will remember him as a friend and, an, as, an, and as an inspiration and a tireless advocate for justice. Now, as someone who has only recently started working on issues related to prisons and punishment as I direct the University of Alberta Prison Project, I am beyond thrilled that we are able to kick the center off with a conference centered around prisons and punishment and to have such a fantastic lineup of speakers. Thank you all for agreeing to participate. Um, we are all looking forward to the next three days of stimulating conversations and panels. Um, I know many of us would usually be at the ASC meetings right at this time, and we cannot really make up for this mega conference and all the coffees and wines and meals you would have shared with friends. But I do hope that you will find these next three days to be intellectually stimulating nonetheless. And I want to draw particular attention to our panels at 1230 Mountain Standard Time today and tomorrow that will feature speakers with lived experience with and in the prison system. And I hope that you'll agree with me that our lived experience panelists are an important addition and voice to our academic speakers. As you know, all of the panels will be streamed on YouTube and you can raise your questions directly on the YouTube channel for the Q&As and engage with the speakers that way. Um, we will also leave the videos of the panels on the channel for three months. So if you miss one, you can catch it at a later time. Uh, and we would love for all of you to tweet and social media, whatever you use about the conference as it is going on. You can use the hashtag uh, prison conference, one word. I also want to draw attention to our publication showcase featuring the publications of our speakers that you can find on our website, canadiancriminology.com, again, one word. Now, conferences don't happen without the help of others, and I want to particularly thank Jeff Prasart, uh, who is the administrative coordinator of the center and has communicated with many of you. Uh, without him, none of this would be possible. Um, thank you for all your help with the technology. As we know, I'm uh, helpless with that. For all of your dedication to the center and for making this conference run smoothly. Also, thank you to all the grad students who volunteered to help out and our session chairs, of course. So now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce David Garland of the NYU Law School and NYU Sociology Department as our keynote speaker. I believe David does not need much of an introduction. We all know David for the eminent scholar that he is, and I'm sure most of us are familiar with his work. David is widely considered one of the world's leading sociologists of crime and punishment, who's the author of a series of, of award-winning books um, like Punishment and Welfare, Punishment in so Modern Society, The Culture of Control, Peculiar Institution, America's Death Penalty in an Age of Abolition, and uh, I believe his newest book, The Welfare State. He's been elected to membership of several societies in both the US and the UK. Um, he, for example, he's a fellow of the British Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He's held a number of prestigious uh, fellowships, for example, the Davis Fellow at Princeton University's History Department and also a Guggenheim Fellowship, among many others. Um, he's been awarded honorary doctorates from not just one, but two universities, uh, the Free University of Brussels and Oslo. And maybe pro most prominently, he won the American Society of Criminologists, uh, Criminology uh, Edwin Sutherland Prize for outstanding contributions to theory and research. And while all this and his many other honors and contributions are super impressive, I think it's even more important to note that I have always known David as one of the most humble scholars who is really generous with his time and a great mentor for junior scholars. So I am beyond thrilled that you are here, David, uh, albeit virtually, and that you have agreed to give this keynote today to open both the center and the conference. And with that, I will give it over to you to speak to us uh, about the roots of injustice. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Sandra. Um, I'm really honored and pleased to take part in the, the opening occasion for the new center, and I wish you great good luck. But the, the recollection of Roger Hood and his 30 years of directorship at the Oxford Center, I think, is really kind of fitting. This is this is the kind of large scale project that um, I think you'll carry through. You and Kevin will carry through. The University of Alberta will, in the same kind of uh, worldwide impact, uh, can follow. So um, my talk this morning is on the roots of injustice, 
and in particular, the structural sources of America's penal state. Um, I apologize that I'm talking about the USA rather than Canada, though, of course, the comparisons are always very flattering for the Canadians. So um, that's my excuse for proceeding. Uh, what I'm trying to do in the talk is really try to bring to bear work I've been doing with others on the question of American penal exceptionalism um, to think that work in the context of the events of the last summer and particularly the radical critiques that have occurred um, on the streets of the USA. So this summer, the national headlines were being made by some strikingly radical critiques of criminal justice. People all across the US demanded that authorities should end mass incarceration, defund the police, make Black Lives Matter. Millions of Americans took to the streets to demand change. And of course, for many criminal justice activists, it seemed to mark a turning point, a moment when the injustices that they witnessed every day were at last being seen and being acknowledged by the wider American public. But for most of the last, most of the prior 50 years, a very different politics prevailed, focused not on the problem of excessive punishment, but on the problem of crime and especially high levels of violent crime. And it was these politics that gave us warrior policing and mass incarceration. So evidently the excesses of the prior era led to the reactions that we see at the present time, kind of dialectical process of action and reaction. But I think both of these moments tell us something rather important about the USA. Compared to other affluent nations, the US is exceptional in the size of its penal system, but also in its levels of homicide and violent crime. And what I'm gonna try and do in this lecture is to describe the roots of these phenomena to identify the structural sources of America's extraordinary patterns of crime and punishment. So as everyone knows, the USA deploys penal controls more extensively and more intensively than anywhere else on the planet. And some people, mostly Americans, regard this as paradoxical since they view the USA as a rich liberal democracy, the land of the free. It's rather less paradoxical when you consider how radically unequal the US is, racially and economically, and how compromised its freedom and democracy have been as a result. And what I'm gonna do in, in this talk is to explain, I think, America's reliance upon mass penal control by reference to its distinctive political economy and its welfare state, and the effects that these have on patterns of social and penal control. The argument has a comparative um, dimension. I'll argue that other affluent nations, and here I'm comparing the USA with places like Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, other affluent nations are much less reliant on penal control because in these places, the social milieu of poor people is much less disorganized and much less dangerous. And because these other societies have more comprehensive welfare states that deal with social problems in more positive and more inclusive ways. In other words, the claim is that there are social structural differences between the US and the rest, not just differences of policy preferences or differences in political choices. So I want to begin to begin by saying something about the character of punishment in the USA. Um, it's my view that, that America doesn't just impose more punishment than any other society. It also punishes in a distinctive way. The leading characteristic of the American penal landscape is the imposition of penal control, a fundamental imperative embodied in sentencing law and in the whole culture of law enforcement. Now this stress on penal control sets America apart from other nations, particularly Western European ones, where penal, penal levies, fines and monetary penalties, and also penal assistance, rehabilitation, reentry support are much more important. American policing with its militarized warrior style and its stop and frisk or zero tolerance policies, and with its extraordinarily high rates of civilian killings, American policing forms the front end of this penal control strategy. And American prosecution, with its aggressive overcharging and its speedy extraction of guilty pleas, is like the constant motion engine that keeps the whole system going. Now we know that every other nation incarcerates at a lower rate than the USA. Canada today has a rate of about 114 per 100,000. Western Europe's average is about 100 per 100,000. And by comparison to these, America, the rate is about six or seven times as high. If one compared to the Nordic nations, 
or to Germany or to the Netherlands, the US rate is 10 times as high. Now, in all of these other countries, criminals are condemned, violence is feared, and considerations of deterrence or public safety or retribution shape criminal justice just as they do in the USA. But the difference is that criminal justice authorities in these other nations do not routinely view offenders as dangerous enemies from whom the public must be protected at all costs, which has come to be the American presumption, especially if the offender is poor, is black, and has a prior record. Outside of the USA, fewer people are sent to custody, sentence lengths are shorter, more offenders are sanctioned by fines and suspended sentences or community-based penalties. Open or minimum security prisons are more common. Home leaves and family visits are more routine. Education and training programs better developed and prison officers better trained. Provision for released prisoners, released inmates is also strikingly different. Last week, the, the National Public Radio um, station here in um, New York ran a story about the early release of hundreds of inmates from a New Jersey prison, all of them being released on an emergency basis because of the spread of COVID. And it described how the released prisoners, many of them who were long-termers who'd served decades inside, some of them physically and mentally impaired, how the released inmates were just left on the streets or in bus stations with no services, not even a government ID, no prospect of housing and no healthcare. And listening to that story, I immediately thought of the contrast with a welfare state society such as Norway and the reintegrative guarantee that Norwegian government gives to all of, the, all of its prison inmates. So there, for example, when prisoners are released, they're guaranteed an offer of employment, education, suitable housing, medical services, addiction treatment, and debt counseling. Now, the contrast just couldn't be more stark. And of course, I'm, I'm pointing to, as it were, extremes of both cases. Um, but the point is simply to, to show up the, the characteristics of the USA. I don't want to idealize criminal justice in Europe or Canada or Scandinavia. The police and prisons of every nation are coercive institutions directed at the poor. All of them have problematic features. All of them in my criticism. But the contrast between America and all these other nations is undeniable. So the question is, how should we explain it? Now, in recent years, a whole body of comparative research in um, comparative sociology, comparative penology, has shown that penal institutions and welfare institutions are tightly coupled and mutually reinforcing. And of course, compared to the USA, all of the nations I've just mentioned have more inclusive, less precarious labor markets and more universalistic welfare states. These nations punish offenders less and they punish them more humanely, not because Europeans or Canadians are more civilized or have no tendency towards racism or punitiveness. They punish less because these nations have economic arrangements, welfare states, and forms of political association that are more solidaristic and inclusive and which thereby reduce the need for penal control. That's one research finding. Another finding that's important is that more equal nations with more generous welfare states have lower levels of violence and fewer social problems. And on that scale, we find that America is once again at the extreme. Americans, compared to other affluent nations, are more exposed to very high levels of criminal violence. The US homicide rate, of course, has fallen quite drastically in the last 30 years, but it's still today three times as high as Canada's and four to five times as high as the Western European average. And of course, these homicide rates are especially high amongst African Americans and Latinos, but even white Americans are killed at a higher rate than the populations of Western Europe. We also think about the widespread availability of guns, and that undoubtedly elevates the American lethal violence rate, but non-firearm homicides are also higher. In other words, the US is more violent, even if you bracket off its peculiar problems with race and with guns. Moreover, and I think this is important to show the breadth of the phenomenon, high rates of violence are not America's only sign of social disorganization. Compared to other affluent nations, 
the US experiences higher than average levels of virtually every social problem. Infant mortality, child poverty, poverty while in work, single parent households, teenage birth rates, mental illness, high school non-completion, drug addiction, drug related deaths. There was a, there was a famous um, study of 23 affluent nations presenting an index of social problems. And on that league table, the USA came exactly last. So why is this? I claim that America is exceptional in state punishment and in criminal violence and in social problems more generally because the, its economy is exceptionally unequal and because its welfare state is exceptionally weak. Compared to other developed nations, America's political economy exposes communities and families and individuals to greater market generated risks, unemployment and poverty, inequality, inadequate housing, food insecurity, and so on. And its welfare state provides them with fewer social protections, social insurance, income support, public provision, healthcare, social rights. And of course, this risk exposure is greatly magnified in segregated communities where African Americans live in conditions of concentrated disadvantage, with the result that virtually on all social indicators, Blacks have worse outcomes. So families and schools and employers in these poor underserved communities are as a consequence less able to carry out the vital work of socializing and controlling and integrating individuals and young people and thereby maintaining social order. The result, and, and criminologists have shown this time and time again, is that this gives rise to unsafe public spaces, to social disorder, and to chronic social problems, including high rates of crime and violence. The result is that the poorest, most segregated neighborhoods in the USA are also the nation's most violent and most dangerous. And this in turn attracts high levels of policing and penal control in poor communities of color, often with disastrous results. Now, at this point, I want to pause for a moment to turn from as it were, the structural argument about these determinations to think a little bit about the political consequences and the way in which these structural facts are inflected and reworked and, and narrated in political discourse. Because in fact, one of the most powerful justifications of the present system is the refrain that penal control simply tracks racially disparate crime involvement. In other words, we hear conservative defenders of the status quo in the USA continually insist on three things. First of all, that blacks are punished more because more blacks are criminal. Secondly, that the police are more active in communities of color because that's where they receive most crime complaints. And thirdly, that courts and sentencers are simply putting black men behind bars in an effort to make black communities safe for law abiding citizens. On the issue of police killings, we've even heard police commissioners talk to the press and say, actually, statistically, um, black citizens who are killed by police at a disproportionate rate, quote, probably ought to be shot more given their greater involvement in criminal conduct. So these are the conservative claims. These are the justifications for the status quo. What are we to make of them? So I think we should begin by acknowledging that racial differences in crime involvement are real with respect to homicide and crimes of violence. Unlike the war on drugs, which was notoriously biased against people of color, arrests and convictions for violent crime and for homicide more nearly correspond with what we know about patterns of criminal conduct. Young black men are more likely to be the perpetrators and also the victims of gun violence than are white people. The US mortality rates, uh, the US mortality tables reflect this pattern, and so, of course, is the, the nation's prison population. Now, conservatives seize upon this fact, and they repeat it at every opportunity. Liberals, on the other hand, tend not to discuss it for, fearing, for fear of appearing racist. But it seems to me that anyone who's taking this problem seriously needs to begin by acknowledging that this is indeed the case, but also by by insisting that acknowledging this fact is merely the first step in the process. We also need to explain how this fact pattern emerges and we need to identify the structural causes that reproduce it. 
High rates of violent crime in poor black communities do not result from racially specific moral failures or cultural differences. They result from segregation, economic exclusion, deep poverty, and the absence of social services, all of which are exacerbated by harsh policing. And whenever we see these same social conditions being experienced by lower class whites, the crime outcomes, the violent outcomes are exactly the same. Though it's hard to find white neighborhoods that are so severely deprived. On, on this point, I want to refer you to uh, Elliot Curry's latest book that just came out all about violence um, and black Americans and the way in which the nation has by and large ignored this problem. Some of which is criminal, some of which is structural. These structural conditions I've been describing give rise to social disorganization and family dysfunction. They give rise to the failures of socialization and integration. They give rise to long-term detachment from the labor market, all of which are problems that liberals shy away from because discussing them too easily seems to blame the victims or reinforce stereotypes. But it seems to me that being silent about this subject is a serious mistake. The processes involved have nothing to do with the intrinsic characteristics or culture of any racial group, and they have everything to do with the difficulties of establishing a healthy social order in places that are deeply disadvantaged and radically underserved. When these social and economic conditions give rise to social problems and drug use, teenage gangs, illegal economies, and crimes of violence, the American response is to label this as a task for penal control and let the police and the prisoners deal with it, usually in ways that exacerbate and entrench the underlying social problems rather than resolve them. What the American authorities do not do is to develop social policy responses designed to, for example, end segregation and impoverishment, provide better housing and better schools, support families, or to move young people into secure, stable employment. Now, I want to make another comment about the implications for politics and criminal justice um, that these structural conditions have. I've been describing their implications for crime and violence, and researchers have extensively documented that connection. But these structural conditions also have implications for crime control, whether I think are more rarely discussed than social science. And here's what I want to say about that. Compared to other nations, American policing and American punishment operate in a much more dangerous and much more disorganized gun-laden environment. Again, I'm comparing with other affluent nations. American police are trained to draw their weapons at the first sign of trouble and to be ready to use lethal force, and they are especially prone to do so in poor high crime communities. And the dangers that we're talking about are not imagined. American police kill many more civilians than do the police of other affluent nations. But American police officers are also killed at a much higher rate. And of course, it's important to hold police responsible for their brutality, and especially for civilian killings, and there's far too little accountability at present, although after the fact prosecution of individual officers are probably not the best way to ensure this. But if we want to get to the root of America's problem, we also have to consider how things look from the police point of view. From their perspective, they are working men and women doing a vital hazardous job protecting the public from dangerous people with few resources other than the use of force. And vitally, politically vitally, the majority of Americans support them in this, making it much harder to hold the police to account for their mistakes or even for their malfeasance. And this disorganized, often dangerous social milieu of America's poorest communities also influences other aspects of criminal justice. When prosecutors and judges know that many offenders have no homes or jobs or income support, it's hardly surprising that they choose to send so many of them to jail. Sentences in other nations can impose fines or community sentences because they, then they know that offenders are less at risk of reoffending and they can refer them to free public services to treat mental illnesses and addictions. American sentences don't have that luxury. The disorganized, dangerous milieu in which so many American offenders live and their lack of access to social services forms the crucial background to this whole problem. But faced with this situation, American decision makers, prosecutors and judges, parole officers, parole agencies, 
They play safe and they resort to warrior policing and to mass incarceration. By doing so, they do nothing whatsoever to remedy the underlying problem, but simultaneously reinforce racial stereotypes and criminalize poverty. So let me say now a few words about the source of this underlying problem, about America's distinctive political economy, which of course, like everything else in the USA, is racialized in its structure and in its effects. Comparative political economy scholars describe the US economy as an extreme version of a liberal market economy. Economies of this kind are characterized by low levels of employment protection, weak trade unions, lightly regulated labor markets, high proportion of workers and low wage insecure jobs, and by welfare state regimes with minimal protections. And again, on all of these measures, the USA is at the extreme end of the range. Of course, America's political economy was modified in the 1930s and again in the 1960s by the New Deal and by the Great Society. In other words, Americans do have a welfare state of sorts. But the protections of these programs were provided on a much less developed basis, on a much less universal basis than those of comparable nations. And at the beginning, they were heavily racially skewed with black workers largely excluded from benefits. More importantly, this phase of US history was a brief one. From the mid 1970s onwards, America's engagement with social democracy gave way to a renewed free market fundamentalism that we've come to call, call neoliberalism. The result, as everybody knows, has been labor union decline, wage stagnation, increased inequality, and deep, deep poverty for those at the bottom of the class and racial hierarchy. At the same time, from the 1960s to the present, the Democratic Party has de-emphasized the struggle for economic justice and focused more on identity politics. So that even as diversity improved and even as explicit racism diminished, there's been a deterioration in the situation of working people in general and poor blacks in particular. In these decades, America's inner cities suffered the effect of deindustrialization a large scale disinvestment by business and declining support from federal and state government. And of course, the unsurprising result of this policy of abandonment, as Pat Sharkey has called it, was a growth in social problems and an unprecedented rise in violent crime, all of which formed the background to the rise of mass incarceration. Now, it seems to me that America's decades long, of decades -long experience of segregating millions of people, mostly people of color, in harsh penal confinement raises a deep moral question. And that question is, how could mass incarceration be tolerated for so long by the American public and by the American political establishment? And it seems to me that the answer to this has to do with the severe limits of fellow feeling, of trust, and of social solidarity that characterizes the USA. In modern America, cross-class and cross-racial solidarity are severely limited, partly because of the long-term legacy of slavery and segregation, but mostly because government has not put in place the institutions that other nations use to develop and sustain solidarities at the national level. Now, let me say what I mean by that. In large, complex societies, solidarity is not a spontaneous or a naturally occurring characteristic, at least not outside of families and small groups. Solidarity is a relational characteristic that has to be built. It has to be instituted and practiced. It has to be realized by institutions that embody shared citizenship and fellow feeling and a parity of esteem. And it has to be reproduced by routine practices of risk pooling and mutual aid that draw us into collective projects and remind us of our shared fate. Welfare state institutions, when they're universalistic and egalitarian, they supply these vital social bonds. They provide citizens with security, they form interests in common, and they build mutual trust in contrast to the ruthlessly competitive market which does precisely the opposite. 
So by repeatedly choosing the market over the social state, American elites have, enrich have enriched themselves while simultaneously reinforcing insecurity and inequality and mutual distrust. So I want to highlight one additional respect, respect in which the presence or the absence of welfare state institutions bears upon the facts of crime and the facts of crime control. Let me summarize. Welfare states are systems of redistribution that reduce inequality. They're systems of social insurance that reduce insecurity. And they're providers of public goods that reduce social exclusion. All of these arrangements, as I've been saying, promote social solidarity and improve social order, and they reduce the social dislocations that give rise to violent crime. But in addition to these effects on the health and well being of civil society, welfare states also have definite effect on state power and on the effectiveness of government. Wherever comprehensive welfare states exist, we also see large scale extensions of state capacity and extensive infrastructures of positive state power. And what this means is that developed welfare states provide multiple front end forms of social prevention, measures that enhance social control and reduce social dislocation. And when deviance or disorder do occur, these states have social services and agencies and caseworkers, they have an apparatus available to deal with these problems in a non-penal manner non-penal manner. By comparison, the social infrastructure of the American state is less extensive and less well-resourced. When American policymakers are faced with demands, for example, to stem the tide of criminal violence, they have fewer options at their disposal, and most of those they have are repressive. The result is the default response, which has defined American crime control for the last 40 years, is to turn to the police to the prison and to the imposition of penal control, which is why in the USA jails are the biggest mental health facilities and why the, the American police are constantly the first responders who deal with everything, homelessness, mental illness, drug addiction, often with disastrous results. So that's the analysis. What I want to do is to conclude by returning to my starting point the contemporary demand for radical change in American criminal justice, and to consider what are the implications of this structural analysis for the radical agenda that was being laid out in the summer months. So the first thing to emphasize is that criminal justice reform is certainly attainable without large scale structural change. How do I know? Because we can point to New York State's success in driving down its prison population and New York City's success in driving down its jail population while sustaining crime rate decreases. That's been the story in, in, in the state where I live for the last 20 years. We can also point to the national decline in juvenile detention that's happened all across the country. Indeed, we can even point to the success of the NYPD in reducing police shootings simply by in, in, insisting on improved training procedures, and enhanced protocols. So all that kind of work can be done. And it can be done without social democracy taking over the USA, without big structural change being put in place. It happens at the local level, and it happens through persistent work by criminal justice activists. But none of this amounts to radical change. None of this amounts to ending mass incarceration. Today in New York State, we still have a, an incarceration rate that's way beyond and way above that of comparable nations. Radical reform, ending mass incarceration is a different matter. To make criminal justice reform most, both radical and sustainable, we would need to deal not just with over imprisonment, not just with, over bias, with racial bias, and not just with police brutality. <clears throat> we would also need to address the underlying problems of social dislocation, and the criminogenic conditions routinely generated by economic and racial exclusion. At a minimum, we need to, to take, we need to undertake four distinct tasks. We'd have to radically overhaul current police prosecution and sentencing practices. We'd have to adopt non-penal methods of reducing crime and violence, such as situational crime prevention, community action. 
We'd have to provide re-entry support, enabling released offenders to build law-abiding lives. And finally, we'd have to construct a welfare state infrastructure and an inclusive labor market that would empower working people, lift up poor families, and make lower class communities less prone to social problems and violent crime. Now, I think in effect, that's what radical fundamental criminal justice reform requires. And in the American context, none of these developments seem particularly likely, at least not in the short term, not even in the medium term. And in fact, history suggests that if these developments do occur, they will occur in exactly the reverse order to how I've listed them here. In other words, there's no nation that's ever built a comprehensive welfare state or ever expanded its existing state in order to reduce crime and punishment. These are predictable long-term effect, but they've never been the, the reason for or the basis for the expansion of welfare state. The social, agents, the social agents that bring about these changes will be working people and their economic and political representatives, not criminal justice activists. Though of course, there's no reason why the latter can't work with the former in a coalition for progressive change. So the thesis I've been arguing implies that sustainable criminal justice reform of a fundamental kind the kind of reform that would align the USA with the other affluent nations and make it cease to be exceptional, that kind of change is only possible as part of a larger progressive movement to make America's political economy more inclusive and egalitarian and its welfare state more comprehensive. And if that's the case, criminal justice activists pursuing fundamental change should spend less time talking about defunding the police or abolishing the prison and more time focusing on the synergies and the structural processes that connect their concerns to social democracy and the movement for economic justice. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to our conversation and our questions and discussion. Excellent. Un unfortunately, um, <laughs> we don't get to applaud in any sort of meaningful way kind of on, uh, on this kind of virtual situation, but applause uh, to David. Thank you very much. It's sort of very sweeping and comprehensive um, and in some ways despairing, but uh, uh, important. I'm responsible for uh, handling questions. I have several questions of my own. We have a system set up that uh, the grad students are going to, not the grad students, a couple of our excellent grad students are going to send me some questions if you have any. So um, if you can do that, that would be great. Um, well, David disappeared. <laughs> there you are. Um, so while I'm waiting for some other questions to arrive, uh, I just, something that uh, I've never really quite understood, maybe you could think about this, is when I was growing up, uh, the, you know, this was during the Cold War, and the American the politics of the American system were constantly pointing to the Soviet Union and its gulag system and its system of mass incarceration as maybe one of the defining features of an authoritarian or totalitarian state. And I've never understood how it is that as the US kind of moved in the exact same directions or worse, that this never seemed to fracture or challenge the American self-identity or its polity, or I'm just curious about if you have any comments or thoughts about that. So I, I agree, it's stunning. Um, and I think, I think it can be perhaps understood or explained by reference to two things. One is the relative invisibility of the massive prison population until quite recently. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the structural effects of modern institutions like the prison is we put our social problems behind walls, away from the public gaze. Um, and until I'd say about the year 2000, no one in, in the, the kind of the journalistic world, let alone the political world, was attending to the fact that the US had such a comparatively high prison population, such that the, the term mass incarceration would be a good description. So. Um, the prison made itself relatively invisible, at least in terms of scale for a long time. But the other question is, how come that this enormous kind of, you know, big government program was never seen as such and, and regarded as um, either 
unacceptable to, to neoliberals or you know, just to Americans in general. And I think that the reason for this was that, that the, the courts and the incarceration of criminal offenders was seen as like a public service, not as a government program. And I think that there was an enorm- there was a lot of work um, enlisting the public in support of punishment and how harsh sentencing and imprisonment, um, not least because the, 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 the public was really very aware of and experienced high background levels of homicide and violence and was more motivated by these kind of concerns. So um, this was seen as a solution rather than a problem, as being um, how to deal with others rather than with American citizens. It was certainly seen as being apolitical. I mean, the, 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 the racial caste of American um, incarceration makes this clearly a racial issue and clearly therefore a political issue. But again, it's only been in the last decade or so, and, and particularly with Black Lives Matter movement, that we've begun to as it were, make that narrative resonate on, on, on the national scene. Yes. Um, so the, I just received a message um, from Celine, it's a, and I will read this. Question on behalf of my colleague, David Johnson. Uh, David, your argument is a wonderful work of insight and synthesis and it's persuasive in many respects. However, I do wonder about the place of white collar crime and responses to white collar crime in your account of penal exceptionalism in the US. Uh, many white collar crime worker, uh, works argue that it is the most harmful and serious crime problem of our age. And many other works argue that the most striking American response to white collar crime in the US is impunity. See, for example, Jesse Eglinton's fine book, uh, the Chicken Shit Club. Uh, how do these white collar crime patterns fit into your account? Perhaps you see the US as unexceptional in these regards or what? Thank you, David Johnson. Um, so, so thank you, David, for this, this question. This is an important topic and it's, it's not one that I've made um, a proper study of. My, my, my inclination is to respond in the following way. First of all, white collar crime um, comparative rates are difficult to have data, difficult to know exactly how that looks one nation compared to another. Much of it remains invisible, much of it's in the borderline between crime and uh, irregularities and illegalities and so on. Um, one would imagine that white collar crime in the USA was operating at a high level. One would also imagine two things. One is that um, competitive market forces and the relative ruthlessness of corporate life in the USA would encourage that kind of behavior. And secondly, the same dominance of corporate interests in American politics would tend to understate the importance of that phenomena and understate its regulation. Um, let, let's say something that isn't exactly white collar crime, but um, is close to it, uh, tax evasion, tax fraud, tax embezzlement. Um, in the USA, the government, the Congress routinely underfunds the, the IRS and its mechanisms of enforcement and auditing. In other words, in contrast to say, you know, the pursuit of welfare cheats, which is extensive and, and funded and, and, and um, energetic, the pursuit of tax cheats is just, you know, soft peddled and un unfunded. And you have to explain that, I think, by reference not to the political economy and structural forces on social control and criminal violence that I was describing with respect to poor communities and criminal punishment, but in a different part of the political economy's consequences for crime. In other words, I see it as being entirely compatible with the story I'm telling and with the distinctive character of America's ruling class and America's corporate power. Um, I don't see it, however, as a story that I've yet undertaken or a research project I've yet undertaken. I'd, I'd very much welcome your, your, your assistance with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the questions have started to arrive. We had a bit of a lag in our system. So uh, a question from uh, Derek Silva. So David, uh, you mentioned that we should focus on the structural conditions that make US exceptional and spend less time focusing on quote, to abolish or defund the police. Why not both simultaneously? So um, there's, no, there's no modern nation that's ever abolished police. Um, and if we were to imagine abolishing the, the, the public tax funded policing, what we would have is uh, private security for the rich and 
the poor exposed to depredation. So, so I, I think that abolishing the police um, is a slogan that can't mean what it says. Of course, what people typically mean is, let's abolish the police as they currently exist in the USA. Let's abolish militarized policing. Let's abolish um, you know, police shooting of civilians, all of which are very uh, appropriate, serious aims. They just shouldn't be uh, wrapped up in a slogan of abolish the police. Similarly, defund the police seems to me to be one of these kind of classically American uh, slogans that re repeats the problem. So uh, defunding the police, first of all, it's a punitive response to police behavior. We should defund them. Secondly, we should do it on the cheap. I mean, the, 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 the notion is that, that the, you, you just move policing funds to social services and that will solve the problem. I mean, basically, as my friend Adana Bismani says, we should defund the rich. We should be taxing people more in order to fund proper policing and all the other social services and investments that are required to make the policing job easier and to make policing more focused on the kind of work that only the police can do, instead of making the police the first responders responsible for every kind of social problem that isn't being otherwise dealt with in poor communities and elsewhere. So myself, I think that the defund the slogan, defund the police slogan was very ill-conceived. The need to hold police accountable the need to, to, to transform policing in this country, the need to get rid of militarized policing, the need to make police community accountable, the, the need to uh, narrow the police's function and extend the, the role of social services in dealing with disorder and social problems. All of these things I completely embraced. Much of my talk was about these things. But the notion of defunding or abolishing the police, similarly the, the idea of abolishing the prison, these are kind of leading edge um, radical uh, propositions or slogans that I think ultimately send the wrong message and certainly backfire in, you know, general election uh, context. I mean, the, the, the Democratic Party representatives up and down the USA made a great, um, took great pains to distance themselves from that slogan, but it didn't take the Republicans long to attribute it to them. And I think to, to, to win lots of support as a consequence. So these are the reasons I'm suggesting that, that thinking about radical change ought not to be framed by that kind of rubric. Great, thank you. Um, I should mention that I don't know that I'm gonna be able to get to everyone's questions, so I'm making some selective decisions here. So apologies if we don't get to your questions. Also apologies for my mispronunciation. So I have a question here from Aziz Unsa. Uh, and the question is, um, discourses of the penal system office fo focus on America and Europe. How do we reconcile this with the penal systems of the global South? So um, I don't know how we reconcile it, but it would be, I think, enormously helpful to, to begin to do comparative work that looked seriously at um, what's, what's framed together as the global South, which of course is just is a generic way of describing half of the globe and, and lots of variation and difference. Um, but I am struck to take one specific example um, by the, the, the way in which the USA continues to think of itself and, and researchers continue to uh, classify it along with, as it were, the other affluent nations, the other liberal democracies, along with the West, in which comparison group it continues to be exceptional and they're at the extreme and different. Now, there are obvious reasons for that choice of comparison. Um, advanced capitalist democratic nation with, with as it were, Western culture and um, a, a set of commercial and political uh, engagements that make it part of that group. But when we're thinking about violence, when we're thinking about policing, when we're thinking about imprisonment, Comparisons with Southern American nations, comparisons, for example, with Brazil, seem much more appropriate, much more telling. When we're talking about the, the, the crime and punishment and control aspect, rather than the economy or uh, the G, uh, GDP or background levels of political assumption. So I think it would be illuminating to begin to look, for example, at the buildup of um, high rates of incarceration for example, in Brazil, there's now, I think, about 360, 100,000 um, people in prison there. Uh, police killings in that nation are, all, are, are off the charts in comparison with the USA. Violence rates, homicide rates, off the charts in comparison with the USA. The US would look much more like a normal nation if the comparison group were the Americas, 
you know, if we included Canada and Chile at the two, uh, at one end of the extreme and, and Guatemala at the other end of the extreme, the USA would be towards the middle of that grouping on many of these dimensions. So I do think that bringing the global south or rather bringing particular nations outside of the West and, and in um, other parts of the globe into conversation with the USA um, would be enormously instructive for our understandings. Um, maybe for mutual understanding, maybe for understanding Brazil and under, as well as understanding the US in the comparison I just mentioned. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so I have a question here from Millie Smith. Uh, and the question is, so what does quote, proper policing, end quote, look like? Uh, what are the jobs that only the police can do? Right. So that, that, that's a good question. Um, and it's not always evident in advance what any situation will contain. Uh, police are first responders who are called to emergency situations. Um, so basically the police are distinguished by having, by being authorized to use violence in their response to law enforcement, in, in their, their, their conduct of law enforcement. That differentiates them from social workers and public health workers and mental health workers and, and uh, homeless assistants and so on. Um, and th there are circumstances where, um, you know, crimes in progress, circumstances where uh, armed assailants, circumstances where there's ongoing assaults, where only that kind of um, potentially violent, authorized violent response um, is appropriate. Um, and the police um, are in that circumstance required and legitimately deployed. However, that describes a very small part of the police, as it were, work calendar. If you were to chart out you know, the, 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 the daily um, activities of police officers, there would be very few of these occasions and very many much more routine social order maintenance activities that could be better done with less likelihood of escalation, less likelihood of violence being used inappropriately, less likelihood of alienation between the authorities and the person with the problems, um, if the police were used for less of the fewer of these jobs. Um, so I don't have a, a kind of neat definition of precisely what it is that policing properly uh, amounts to. And there's always going to be blurred lines between, uh, as it were, law enforcement at the crime level and social problem solutions that kind of surround that. Um, nevertheless, it's perfectly clear that in the US, the um, the poverty of other social services and other agencies means that the police are called on to do much more of the work and therefore end up um, criminalizing social problems and end up um, brutalizing people whose problems are mental illness or homelessness, um, not criminal activity and violence. So keeping with the police theme, um, there's a question from Brianna Lewis. Uh, she was wondering if there's anything to be said about the high rates of suicide among police officers. It's actually a two-part question, quite different uh, questions. And the second part is, do you have any comments on the impact of penal policy on penal culture? So two very different types of questions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the penal policy impact on penal culture question. Um, but the high rates of suicide amongst police officers. So, so, so sometimes um, something as fundamental and profound as suicide can be explained by something that seems rather superficial like opportunity. And the, the, the fact that uh, the, the police officers have guns in their homes actually makes the, the, the possibility of their suicide that much more likely in the same way that um, the, the great kind of uh, reduction in suicides that occurred when British gas supplies stopped being toxic um, <laughs> and immediately reduced the number of people who were killing themselves by putting their heads in the oven and, and didn't just reduce that method, but reduced the number of suicides. Um, so, that, so there's some part of that, but high rates of suicide amongst police officers in, in a way, it's kind of understandable. I haven't studied, you know, categories of employment and suicide patterns, but you would sort of expect people engaged in the kind of work that police officers um, engage in, um, to be on the one hand, often troubled and, and often as it were carrying problems home from their work 
um, into their personal lives, and two, to be, to be more liable to that kind of response than perhaps people in other employment activities. So um, my guess is that the, the, the issue you're describing is probably quite a universal one. It may be that suicide rates by profession always have police officers higher up there than, for example, academics. I think so, I'm guessing. Um, but it, it may also be that there's something particular about the, the, the US um, situation of police officers, maybe the Canadian one too, that makes that rate higher than it need be. So um, maybe just, I'll, I'll, I'll have the chair's privilege and maybe I'll ask the last question and then we'll take a break and we have another session starting at 9.30. So um, my question as you were talking, uh, I, my mind went back to a piece that Nancy Fraser wrote years ago, where she described the change in American politics on the left from a politics of redistribution to a politics of recognition. Mm -hmm. Implicit in your talk, was that a mistake? Um, so, so recognition, esteem, standing is something that can be redistributed to, right? I mean, so, so, so the, the, really the, the difference is not between uh, recognition, redistribution, it's between economic politics and identity politics. Right. That, that's, that's the issue she's talking about. And it, it does seem to me that the, the, the abandonment of um, redistribution politics after the New Deal that the, the, the shift in the character of the American Democratic Party away from issues that might, for example, have dealt with um, black working class and black poor to dealing instead with black applicants for university places um, was is what she's talking about and is, is a big part of the problem. Um, the, 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 the need to embrace urban politics and to do something about them has been relaxed by the fact that the Democratic Party can by and large rely on a kind of guaranteed vote from yeah. urban black populations. I mean, that this, this, is, this is changing, that the, the recent uh, Trump-Biden figures suggest that it's not just so solidly clear, particularly amongst males, particularly amongst the Hispanic males. Um, but nevertheless, I think that that's been one reason for the relaxation of the Democratic commitment, the Democratic Party's commitment to redistribution. And I, I do think that's been a huge error politically. Um, it's one of the things that's, got, that's alienated uh, the, the, the base from the party. And, and I, do, I do see Nancy Fraser's point. Yeah. So I, I just got one more uh, message from our colleague, uh, Kanika Wortley. So I'll, I'll give her uh, the last question. So maybe you could speak to uh, police accountability uh, how can this be increased? How can police uh, trust in police and confidence in the police institution uh, be increased? And maybe you can speak to some specifics. Right. So, so police, police accountability um, is obviously crucial. Um, an unaccountable police force, a police force where the public tolerate illegalities and tolerate routine violence is a police force that's going to embrace that mode of behavior, and they do in the USA. On the other hand, it's, it seems to me that, that um, it's a mistake to focus all our attention on the criminal prosecution of individual officers after the fact. Um, not, not just because juries often are unwilling to bring charges or unwilling to find guilt, but more importantly, because that kind of after the fact punitive response is less, less likely to produce System, systemic change and improvement. And what, what I would say was that, 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 that police accountability ought to be systemic, it ought to be built into training, it ought to be built into um, the practice of police at the front end, rather than the criminal justice response to police misbehavior at the back end. Great, thank you very much for that. This was uh, stimulating and um, uh, we will transition now to a break. Uh, we have a session starting at, I guess, 9.30 in Edmonton. No idea what time that is where everyone else is. So um, that's about, oh, about 20, 25 minutes from now. Uh, the session will include presentations by uh, Ben Crew, uh, Justin Tetro,
Uh, Ruben Miller, I noticed that Sandra has rejoined us, or at least she's shown her face. Did you want to say add anything else? No, thank you so, so much, David. This was very intellectually very stimulating, super interesting. And I just wanted to let you know that we had over 200 people watching live. Um, so it was an excellent turnout. And I hope that we will see many of you uh, back for the 930 panel. Thank you, everyone. And I and apologies to people who um, I, whose questions I didn't get to. I just noticed another one popped up. There's obviously a lag in the system. So apologies, we will, we will persevere. Yes, thank you, David. <clears throat>